using African-American women as a kind of window onto the American Revolution transforms the way we understand the American Revolution. Uh, again, it seems to me that much of what slave owners were fighting for, liberty, freedom, uh, independence, is exactly what African-American women and men uh, were fighting for when they opposed uh, the men who we call the Founding Fathers. Uh, the British were uh, very strategic in uh, how they dealt with slaves, in, uh, especially in the American South, in the plantation area. Uh, they offered freedom to any slave who would leave the plantation and come to the British Army camps. The goal, of course, was not particularly to give African Americans freedom. The goal was to disrupt the economy of uh, the South and disrupt the food sources of, of uh, the American uh, revolutionaries and to cause general chaos in communities. Uh, and they started this as early as 1775, even before independence had been declared. Uh, the governor of Virginia issued a proclamation that said that any slave willing to abandon traitorous planters would be given uh, his freedom. Uh, the American response to this is rather telling. That is the response of the House of Burgesses, which we think of as the great source of liberty in America, uh, was that any slave who did this and was caught would be executed or sent to the West Indies, which was the equivalent of execution because life on the sugar plantations was brief and really quite horrible. Uh, so uh, to the surprise, I think, of Governor Dunmore, the women and men and children flocked if they were in the vicinity to the British encampments uh, the, and um, they formed a African regimen of soldiers that they called, uh, when fighting broke out, that they called the Ethiopian uh, regiment. And across their chest they wore a banner with one word on it and the word on it was liberty. And so right away, you, I think you can understand that there were different agendas in the American Revolution. Anywhere the British Army went in the South, they tended to issue proclamations like this. That is, the generals uh, issued proclamations like this. And I have accounts in my book, Revolutionary Mothers, of women who walked 50 miles with a baby in their arms and a child holding a child's hand to get to the British Army encampment so that uh, they could gain their freedom from slavery. Uh, the story of how these people were treated is almost uniformly a tragic story. For instance, the Ethiopian regiment and the women and children that joined uh, the African American men, uh, when smallpox or some form of communicable disease broke out among their ranks, uh, the British Army abandoned them on an island in the Chesapeake and left them healthy ones as well as stricken ones left them there to die because they said, we don't want our soldiers to be infected. And that story is really a model for what is going to happen to African Americans seeking their freedom throughout the American Revolution. These women who walked miles to get to uh, the British Army camp, like the men who walked to the British Army camp, risking their lives because they were, if they were caught, it was a death sentence. When they got there, they were really not given enough food to remain healthy enough to ward off all those communicable illnesses that spread through encampments like this. 
uh, many, many more soldiers were stricken, white and black, were stricken by communicable diseases, by what they came to be called camp fever. Uh, anything that hit was called camp fever. Uh, but if you're undernourished and underclothed and were not given sufficient blankets, if you were really, in many cases, worse off than you were on your plantation, then you were susceptible to illness. African American men rarely were allowed to fight. Instead, they were given jobs like building roads or digging moats or dish, uh, ditches or all the kind of grunt work, the physical labor that was involved uh, to protect the British Army. Lots and lots of these people died. That is, they did not survive through the war.